Well, I mean, that it's an interesting angle on we were having a, again conversations in the speakers lounge talking about how runaway queries can take out a database. I'm like, well, you know, you can set up governor policy so that mm -hmm. if the query is above yep. a certain cost threshold, it just won't run. But few people know about that. Right. The idea that we could actually take a build package for a database, here are all the patches, mm -hmm. and evaluate the costs, maybe get an estimate of time and impact mm -hmm. before we run it. Yeah, yeah, that would be huge. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a big, because I know we do that in a pre-production environment. Right? I mean, that's the practice you do. And you quickly figure out, hey, this is one of those four-hour updates. Well, and even if you, if you project that back to the move in the industry is like virtualize almost everything. Yeah. But right? it's, it's like, what is the cost of hosting this app? It's like, how much memory do I need? Mm -hmm. It's like, most people, it's like, the whole storage they know is like, we have that figured out. It's like, uh, CPU, they can figure that out. But it's like, how much memory do I need to run for this database, right? right? It's, like, it's like, from a virtualization perspective, it's like, what is it that I need to allocate? Mm -hmm. Being able to come up with footprints and models based on your schema and your data distributions and your utilization to actually come up with that stuff, that, that would be killer. Ma and massive. The other thing that happens when we get into development environments is suddenly the, the testing practices and things that we're quite oh. used to in code suddenly apply to, to T-SQL. Yeah. And, and it's like it's amazing how few people actually practice it. For, I mean, I, on the dev side or on the database on side? On the database side. Well, I, I mean, there's that many people practice on the, on the dev side either, I'm afraid. But it's got to be a shocker yeah. for a T-SQL guy to actually look at the sophistication of, of our testing infrastructures these days. Right. But it, it, it's like, how many people do see their schema as the contract between the data store and the application? Oh, yeah, exactly. That's a, great I, that's a philosophical, philosophical discussion, but mm -hmm. it's like, I think that's the key of a lot of things. It's like, if we start treating it that way, it's like if we're really crisp about what that contract is. Right and express that and be able to enforce that, then you, there is a need. Now you can start to test it. Mm -hmm. You can test at every layer inside your stack instead of just going through the whole stack, which most people do. It's like they only do end-to-end -end testing. Right. Um, and that provides a lot of value, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, being able to take smaller vertical stripes of tests so that you can deploy and test individual components, you know, can have a choice as to how much, you know, I know with one of the challenges I have with continuing integration is as the site gets bigger, we just can't build every time. Yep. You know, we've got to say, we're only going to build once every three hours because the test suite's so large. That's the big one. Well, that, that's also, is like if, if you have, one of the features that we're working on for 2.10 is, is like is, is impact analysis. Right. All right. So you make this change and based on the, if you use code coverage information the reverse way, mm -hmm. you can determine the impact of a change. Right. And therefore determine which test you need to run for this check-in. That's interesting. It's just interesting to think about that from a database perspective. The yeah. impact of those things are going to have, especially when we start talking about table modifications or I mean, some wide-ranging impacts mm -hmm. that are very different from the way code is impacted in those scenarios. Well, it, it, it's like closality check uh, or referencing and it's like following the reference into your app tier right. is, like, is, is a key aspect to this. Like, if you want to be able to do this kind of impact analysis, you, you need to understand is like that this piece of code actually relates to this piece in the database. Right. So today I can tell you if you make this change in the database, this is the impact of the da inside the database. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot project it out yet into it's like to the app tier. Right. Um, but it's like with the infrastructure that we're putting in place by other teams like Team Architect, with like the Architecture Explorer. Mm -hmm. It's like once that is plugging into the data tier, it's like you have full end-to-end -end causality. Right. And that, that way, it's like you can have that impact. Well, especially when I start thinking in context of some of the ORM technologies coming along now, where I have persisted objects and I've really not even thought about the data storage mm -hmm. impact, to be able to have a tool that could sort of look through that and say, here's how it's going to impact the, the database ultimately. Yeah. That's, uh, are we getting a sense of the future of the product then? That it, it's, like, it's, it's like ultimately the roadmap is to actually start addressing that problem. Right. And it's like there are multiple teams actually contributing to this, uh, to the technologies here. It's like there are various technologies that are fundamental here. Uh, for example, as I said, the architecture team is doing the end-to-end -end architecture explorer mm -hmm. uh, that allows you to plug in the multiple tiers. It's like they're enforcing contracts between layers, which right. is why the contractual representation is so important. It's like the data team um, 
being opening up their model infrastructure so it can be leveraged for ORM generation right. and all these kind of things. So yes, that's definitely the direction that we're going in. So that that's it's an exciting area. So. Well, yeah, and then, and then we start talking about that team system angle of the interaction, being able to task back and forth, to create work items. Yeah. That a modification to an object ultimately can propagate a work item to the database guys and vice versa. So they can exactly. and yep. keep those contracts up to date and, yep. and be aware of what's impacting them. Yep. It's and th that is that is exactly where we're going. That's an so. exciting thing. Yeah. I mean, I see a real split here. There's on this side, this story talks about the database development process being a first class citizen in the development team. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I, I get the sense that we, we look, we're looking upon data storage as a utility. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're also getting that, that cloud angle of just hold my stuff mm -hmm. and you know, let me know when I can have it, when I, when I get it back. Sure, but it's like you still want to have guarantees about those base principles. About, yeah. It's like, I have my schema, this is my contract. Sure. Uh, you need to version that. It's like you have version policy between the contract between your app and your data store. It's like you might be able to express less explicit state or make less explicit statements about your store in the cloud. Right. Um, they probably don't want you to make any statements about physical aspects like indexes yeah. or placement or whatever. Well, a lot of but, people don't want to care about that. Right. They want to go, it just gets stored. Yeah. But at least a layer of abstraction so then there's options and mm -hmm. how we store them and yeah. handle that as well. But it, it's like your development environment shouldn't have to change because you make that choice to actually move it into the cloud. Right. Interesting. So. Right. Really cool. great to talk to you. All right. Thank you, Richard. You bet.